Good morning. How oh, very good it is that you have come. And those of you at home watching this later, welcome as well. As I was sitting silently in prayer over here, I heard a voice. It wasn't the voice of God, it was the voice of Daryl telling me that it is working, the camera, so there will be a recording of this service that hopefully you will be able to see afterwards online. Technology is a challenge sometimes. We are without phone and internet till at least Monday. But we are here and we have gathered in the name of Jesus and we are here to praise God and to make that connection, that vital connection to the source of our life, the source of all love, to the God who called us on this journey. And I'm so glad you've, you've gathered today that we can do this together. Please rise for the call to worship. We are brought here today to glimpse the hope that Christ has for us. Open our hearts to receive that hope. We are brought here today to be healed of our fears. Heal us, Lord Jesus, with your love and power. Come, let us receive the vision and healing love of God. Praise be to God, who continues to bless and restore us. Amen. Our opening hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See the First Two Verses. We have gathered here in the hope that the grace of God revealed to us in Jesus will open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the truth of God's love, which is the bedrock of our existence. You are God's beloved child, and no matter how the powers of death and darkness may have had you in a stranglehold this week, you are here in this place where together God's grace sets us free. You are cherished. God delights in you and God has a holy purpose for your life. And we are here to lay hold of that promise and that hope that cannot die. And so let us lift up our voices as one voice and sing the song of Alleluia.
as Jesus breathed peace into his frightened disciples in that upper room after his resurrection, so he breathes peace into us, the peace which passeth all understanding. It is a peace that takes down the walls, the walls that separate us from our truest self, from one another, from God. We are one. Let's claim that gift of peace that Christ gives us. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Please be seated. And we are going to be blessed once more by our choir singing an anthem to the praise of God.
Praise God. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Terry. So, it's our time for the children. We have some children. We have Matthew and Tommy. We have Maddie. We have Ryan hiding behind his mother. Uh, so glad you're here. So glad you're here. So we started this little tradition recently. It started with Steve Blake sending me a picture of his cat. Then Tim Tyler sent me a picture of his cat. Last week I had a picture of my dog. And today we have pictures of Daryl and David's dogs. Teddy, Fancy, Bailey, great names, huh? And uh, they're pretty adorable. We put these pictures up here because we remind ourselves that God loves all living creatures, all living creatures. So if you've got a picture, I have a one already lined up for next week, but I'll take your pictures and they'll get in here eventually. All right, okay. So anybody know what the special day in the church calendar is that comes this Wednesday? Does anybody know what that might be called? Uh, Maddie knows. Ash Wednesday, correct, Maddie. Ash Wednesday, and the season we call Lent begins on Ash Wednesday. The children, there's a picture of a child with what? A cross, right, made out of ashes. And you may see some children at your school who do that. And if you come here on Wednesday evening with your parents, I'll put a cross on your forehead too. Why do we do that? Well, we do that as a sign that we belong to Jesus and we want to walk with Jesus. We also want to remind ourselves that life is, is special, right? Life is precious. And... Uh, this breath we have, take a breath. How many breaths do you think you have in a lifetime? Who knows? A lot. But there will come a day when we'll have our last breath on earth and we will go to be with God in heaven. So life on earth is special. We don't want to waste it. Waste it with things that, that keep us from living it fully, lovingly, joyfully. So we want to try to figure out how during this season we can live our life closer to Jesus Anybody know how long Lent lasts? How many days are there in Lent? Man, no one's going to risk a job. Well, there are 40 days in the season of Lent. It's, it's made here like it's almost like a game. This is Ash Wednesday right here, which is this coming Wednesday. And then there are days all along the way. Interesting detail. Sundays in Lent aren't counted during the 40 because it's like they're little Easter's. But we have this whole period where we're journeying. And what happens when we get to the end? Well, we have Holy Thursday, the night that Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. Then we have Friday, Good Friday, when Jesus died on the cross. And the last day of Lent is Holy Saturday. And what comes after Holy Saturday? Maddie, e Easter Sunday. So part of what Lent's about is getting us ready for Easter, for the joy of Easter. How to live with Jesus in a special way. And it's 40 days because Jesus sent, spent 40 days in the wilderness before to get ready before he began his ministry. We'll hear about that next week. And also the people of the Hebrew people, when they were set free by God from Pharaoh in Egypt, how many years did they spend in the wilderness? Forty. So those are the echoes about why we have 40 days in Lent. So we want to figure out ways to keep Lent as a special time for us to kind of grow in God's love. How would you like to keep the season of Lent? This is kind of your choice. Think about some way to keep those special 40 days. For 40 days, you could add something to your life, or you could take something away from the way you live each day. So I want you to think about that before Wednesday. You could add a special time each day, a couple of minutes, maybe in the morning or late at night, when you just want to spend time being with God, praying. Make that a special part of your day that you haven't been doing. Just see what it's like to spend some quiet time, just you and God together. You could read a Bible story together with your family each day. 
You could pray together if you're not already doing that before your supper. And um, you can uh, try to find somebody each day that you don't usually think about to do something kind to. That's another good idea. But when you pray together, one of the things I was going to suggest, you probably heard, or maybe you didn't, that there, there's a war that brought out, that's broke out this week in a faraway place called Ukraine. And war makes Jesus very sad because people hurt, people die, people cry. And maybe you want to pray each day for the people of Ukraine, the sad child, and for the soldiers who don't want to be in the war, but that they're forced to be there. And uh, it's, war is not what Jesus wants. So let's pray for that, okay? That'd be a good thing to do during Lent. Okay. And maybe we can find some ways to give money to help the people who are going to really be suffering there. You can take something away. You, do you ever lose your patience with anybody particular? Well, you could say, I'm going to make a special effort during the season of Lent to pay attention to those places I'm learning where I'm losing my patience and try not to lose my patience. I can stop complaining, you know? Life is precious. Why waste it with being a complainer? Why waste it with saying you're bored? Life is a miracle. We can stop fighting. You know, if we want there to stop fighting way over in Ukraine, maybe we should stop fighting with our families. You know, do our part to bring God's peace into this world. So those are some ideas for you. Think about how you want to spend that special season of 40 days that begins this Wednesday. So it can be a time you get closer to Jesus and then can really celebrate when we remember how he rose from the dead and is with us forever. And whatever you do, whatever you try to do, like you're trying to not lose your patience, ask Jesus to help you because he is with us. Ask for help to keep your promises during Lent. Okay. This great love is why we always say at the end of our children's time, what? There's always room in the circle. All right. It's our time, kids, to pray together. Anybody, anyone they want to pray for? Why don't we pray for those frightened, scared people in Ukraine, especially the kids and the moms and the dads and the soldiers, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus, who has walked with us on this earth and guides us even now on this journey. Help us to walk with you in a special way during Lent. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn the things that make for peace, as Jesus said when he came to Jerusalem. Help us to feel God's, your, your great love for the people who are hurting. We raise them up, those in the midst of war, those who are sad and scared, those who aren't getting enough to eat now. We ask, O oh Lord, that we find a way to help them. And th pray for everybody who's lonely or frightened or sick at this time. Help us, O oh Lord, to follow Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, and it's time to wave to little Michael. Michael, hi Michael. Thank you, Michael. All right, and it's time for our children to go to Sunday school. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, all our Sunday school teachers. All right. Our hymn at this time is the third verse of Open My Eyes That I May See. Please rise.
Please be seated. So this Sunday marks the end of the season of Epiphany that we have been for several weeks uh, about times when the, the deeper meaning of life gets revealed, uh, the meaning of God's love in our life. And we finish Epiphany with Transfiguration Sunday, which is perhaps the kind of clearest uh, epiphany of God's light and love that a human being witnessed which was up on the mountain, a story we're about to hear. Uh, what immediately precedes what well, I'm going to read, um, there's been a turning point in the story of Jesus, and he has asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And for the first time ever, Peter puts into words, you are God's Messiah. And it's the right answer, but at that point, Jesus proceeds to tell them what is kind of a shocker, which is that as the Messiah, he must go to Jerusalem where he will suffer, be rejected by the religious authorities, and die, and on the third day rise. But I don't think they heard that part. Um, and that was upsetting to them. And then he proceeds to say these words, which uh, um, kind of like define the theme of Lent. He said, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. So, the journey of Jerusalem is about to begin, but first, Jesus makes a trip up a mountain. Our gospel reading comes from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in the 28th verse. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took, them, took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men Moses and Elijah talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Then the voice, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days and told no one any of the things that they had seen. Thus ends the reading of our lesson. May God bless our hearing of the word. So last week in my sermon, I invited you to think about the fact that before the gospel is a set of teachings, it's a story. It is a story about Jesus and his great love. And at the heart of this story, there is an invitation to us to consciously, intentionally have a relationship with God, the God revealed to us in Jesus. The gospel story is told by the four gospel writers, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel are quite similar, they follow a similar pattern. And each gospel writer takes different nuances to that story. Um, in the case of Luke, one of the things he wants to emphasize in his telling of the story is just how much time Jesus spent in prayer. It was a lot. Now, I think that Matthew and Mark just assumed we understood that, but Luke wants to spell it out for us. 
So for instance, in the story that we heard early on in the season of Epiphany, where Jesus goes to the River Jordan and is baptized by John, the moment in which Jesus hears the voice of God say, you are my beloved child with whom I delight, happens not during the baptism itself, but when Jesus is sitting quietly on the riverbank praying. It is when he's praying that in that silence he hears the voice of God speak to him and he is empowered by the Holy Spirit that descends upon him like a dove. Luke also tells us early on in the story, chapter 5, verse 16, that as these huge crowds begin to flock to Jesus because he's like a rock star drawing people because of his healing power, Jesus very intentionally goes away on a regular basis to find a solitary place in the wilderness to be alone, specifically to pray. And the implication is that Jesus recognizes that with all this attention, all this fanfare, it's going to be easy for him to be distracted from the path he's called to follow, and also that he's going to lose his, his power is going to drain out of him, and he needs to be in prayer. Luke also specifically tells us that before Jesus calls his 12 disciples, he spends a whole night in prayer. And in that story I talked to you about just before the story of the mountaintop, Jesus is in prayer when he decides it's time to tell them about his journey to Jerusalem, where the, where the narrative of the story changes and now the destination is the cross. And he's praying as he opens up that conversation. And this story that I just read for you of the transfiguration occurs pretty much the same in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. But Luke, once again, wants us to know that the specific reason that Jesus goes up in the, on the mountain is in order to pray. And once again, probably Mark and Matthew just assumed we understood that, but Luke spells that out. And there's a specific reason that's calling him to pray at this time, and it is that he is beginning that journey, that difficult, difficult journey to the cross with the suffering and the death that faces him. In my mind, it's a little bit like he is entering into this hurricane with violent winds but he wants to first go into the eye of the storm to that place of stillness where he can connect with the eternal love of God the stillness and up there on the mountain as he's praying we're told that in some sense what happens is he enters into his resurrection body while he is yet in his physical body the radiant light is like that that will come at the resurrection. So he is experiencing, before going to the cross, the reality of the resurrection and that love that is greater than death. He is getting the sustenance he needs to make the difficult journey ahead. And uh, so we get a glimpse in the story of how important Jesus it was for Jesus to pray, how vitally important it was for him to pray. But the story also makes it very clear that we are to pray and it gives us guidance about how to go about prayer. Midway through the story, the attention turns to the disciple Peter. And it's interesting. He has this curious response to the fact that he is gazing in an unveiled manner into the glory of God. His response, did you notice what it was? He starts to run off at the mouth. He starts to babble on. He starts to talk about all his thoughts about what needs to happen next. Hey, Jesus, what we need to do now is to build these little shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Uh, he's got ideas about what needs to happen. Words babbling on. And Luke makes a point of telling us he has no idea what he's talking about. Uh, it's an interesting response, is it not, to, to this moment of being in the mystery of God's presence. And then the, the voice of God is heard. And it says, this is my beloved son, my chosen. Listen to him. Listen to him. 
So, the larger meaning of this all is that prayer is very important. But uh, it gives us some guidance about the nature of prayer. When, Jesus, when Peter starts talking, it's accurate to say that he is praying. He is talking to Jesus, after all. And prayer involves our putting words forth as best we can to God. And sometimes, like in the case of Peter, those words will be chaotic. And sometimes, as we often see in the book of Psalms, the, the, the words we put forth will present ourselves not in the best light. It, prayer begins with putting words out there that express where we are in the present moment. And, and Peter's doing that. He's just sort of overwhelmed and bewildered. And he's, he's, he's got this sort of scatterbrained words coming out of him. And whatever we're experiencing at the present moment, to bring that in words to God, that is a part of prayer. But the story makes it clear that prayer is not just about the words we make. Prayer is about listening. Prayer is about listening. If you're only talking but not listening, you're not fully praying. Um, and as the story proceeds, the cloud overshadows the mountain and it silences, it silences Peter. The, the bright light is eclipsed by this darkness. He can't see his hand in front of his face. And that absolutely silences the words that come out of his mouth. And it's at that point that he hears the voice of God. So, larger meaning of this, prayer is important. And that prayer includes listening. And subpoints to this larger point, uh, silence is necessary to truly listen. You can't, you can't listen if you're talking. And the second point is we need to get clear about who it is we're listening for, whose voice we're listening for as we go about praying. Now, to elaborate these two basic points, I want to talk about the experiences of two women connected with our congregation um, who have made some remarkable progress intentionally engaging the practice of prayer that has borne fruit in their life. You, few of you may know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to name them, but I'm sure they'd be happy to talk about their experience. Um, the first woman... Uh, I want to talk about in relationship to the need to enter into stillness and silence in order to pray. But there's a problem with that in that to varying degrees, all of us find silence and true stillness challenging. It varies from person to person. But uh, you, you see that in, in Peter's response up in the mountain. The silence of what he's experiencing kind of he feels compelled to fill it with his words, right? He's uncomfortable with the silence. Um, but how can we listen if we're talking? So the woman that I'm going to tell you about has been regularly attending my Wednesday and Thursday sessions of guided meditation and prayer on Zoom. This may sound like an advertisement for those sessions. My larger point, though, is to talk about the challenge that is silence. So, to varying degrees, we all find silence difficult, but some more than others, and there are two reasons for this. For some of us, our brains are just wired in a ma manner, it's our genetic makeup, whereby our, our default setting of our brains is to go to problems and try to figure them out. We do this kind of compulsively. Uh, the other thing has to do with trauma. And all of us, to some extent, have experienced trauma in life. Uh, but for some people, the traumas they've experienced in their life, the pain these traumas cause, in silence, there is like space for that trauma's pain to rise up. And for this woman, both of those things were in play. That when she would go into silence, uh, she would find herself 
go into worry mode, trying to figure out all the problems of her life. And also there were some painful feelings, uh, grief and things that would rise up in that silence. So why would she want to go into silence? She avoided it her whole life, but she was willing to give it a try with me, and uh, for which I was grateful. I want you to go, want to tell you briefly what happens in these sessions. So uh, I began with a little prayer, and then for 25 minutes, I talk gently and slowly. So there's not real silence for 25 minutes. The idea is people listen to my voice, and hopefully things begin to calm in their brains. I invite people to pay attention to their breath, and hopefully as we do, our breath slows down, and we kind of come to the present moment. I lead people through these little exercises of tightening and relaxing muscles so that hopefully we'll get more relaxed. Then I invite people to use their imagination to picture Jesus standing behind them, loving them, placing his hands upon their head, and then visualizing this light, the same light coming that was on that mountaintop, coming down from the hands of Jesus, pouring through their bodies. This all goes on for like 25 minutes. The point is, that's not real silence yet, but what it does do is help people get to a place where their brains are quieting down some. They're becoming more comfortable with stillness. And then we enter into real silence for five minutes. Because of the prep time, people often find that a whole lot easier now. And for this woman, she said this is the first time in her, ever, her entire life when she's been able to sit in silence and find it tolerable and, and to some extent pleasurable to experience this sense of beyond the words, she is in the loving presence of God. The truth that is expressed in Psalm 46 where it says, be still and know that I'm God. That there, when all the noise begins to subside, is the reality of God's love. And she experienced that, and the, the ability to sit in silence in and of itself was significant for her, and it began to have gentle effects on the rest of her life. You know, that, that anxious chatter that's usually in the backgrounds of most of our heads, it's still there, but a little less loud, a little less loud. So, um, I want to turn now to the second point, which is that we need to be clear about who it is we're listening for in the silence. Um, in the gospel story, this is emphasized. You will remember that there's Moses and Elijah appearing essentially from heaven to be with Jesus on the mountaintop. Peter sees them and sees them as equals in his mind. That's a great compliment to Jesus. He wants to build three little shrines to them. The cloud comes, overshadows, silence. The voice says, this is my beloved son, my chosen. Listen to him. The cloud passes. Moses and Elijah are not there anymore. Clear message. Jesus is the one to listen to. Now, it, it is valuable, worthwhile, for us to read the entire Bible. But it's important to know who is, whose voice is most authoritative. That's Jesus' voice. So when we read the Law and the Prophets, which is what Moses and Elijah represent, or when we read Apostle Paul, for that matter, we are doing so through the lens of what we know about Jesus. So when we see something that contradicts the spirit of Jesus as we have come to know him in the Gospels, well, we recognize there's a problem there. Jesus is the one we listen to first. And that's important when it comes to interpreting the Bible. But it also emphasizes the importance of knowing Jesus, to, to read the Gospels, to get a sense for what, what's important to him, how he responds to things so that we can recognize his voice. It is possible when you enter into silence that you will hear voices. 
and they won't necessarily be the voice of Jesus. How do you tell? Well, the, the be best thing is to be well acquainted with what Jesus' voice cares about. And if, if, if what the voice is telling us contradicts what we know about Jesus, that's not Jesus' voice you're hearing. So you have to be able to discern whose voice we're listening to and listen specifically for Jesus. Um, some people ask, when I pray, who should I pray to? Should I pray to God? Should I pray to Jesus? Frankly, it doesn't matter. But because at the heart of the gospel is a relationship, um, and we know relationships primarily through people, it can be helpful to pray to Jesus, a person that we're familiar with through the gospels, as we did in the guided meditation. To picture Jesus, that can be helpful, but it's not a necessity. Now, this woman, she was given a couple of years back this devotional uh, daily devotional uh, that invites a person to, to sit and do the reading, to spend some time in prayer, and specifically it, it, it challenges a person to, to try to, to engage all of their life in relationship to Jesus, to bring their life to Jesus. She liked the book when she uh, would pray with it, it was, would calm her, but only in the last year did she decide she needed to make this like the central focus of her life, that she needed to take this very seriously. She needed to change the mental habits of the way her brain works. And so what that meant was learning, and this is learning, this is work, that as she went through the course of her day and things would arise that were anxiety provoking or, or brought on sadness, um, to bring it to Jesus, to very consciously, Jesus, this is what I'm feeling right now. Scared, I'm feeling frightened, I'm feeling upset. To make a habit of doing that at that point. Now, it didn't deliver her from all those things, but it, it had the impact of keeping her from spiraling down into a deep, dark place. Now, this woman is a sensitive soul, and the, the nature of sensitive souls is that we are often inclined to anxiety and depression. Such was the case for her. Um, the practice didn't change everything, but it did keep her from spiraling down. So, for instance, she could feel sad. And it's appropriate to feel sad because life has got grief and we should feel the sadness. But she could, in this process of bringing it consciously to Jesus, something would happen that she would not go then spiraling into a deep depression, which is a kind of deadness of spirit, which is different from feeling the sadness of grief. And people have noticed that she's more even keeled now. And it, it's about this intentional journey of trying to change the way her mind works so that she learns this habit of going to Jesus in the course of her day, with the good stuff too. So, with these two women's example, I want to just invite you to think about the season of Lent. For, for Jesus, it was so important to go up as he's heading into this hurricane of violent winds to touch the silent, eternal core. Um, and we live in a world that's full of violent winds, right? We're going into Lent just as this war is breaking out. And it's really important for us to touch that eternal, silent peace because we don't want to be part of the violence. We want to be a part of God's peace. Um, and these two women give you proof, I think, that it, it's, in, it's, in, it's possible through a combination of effort and God's grace to change the way we live uh, on these very nuts and bolts things about how we experience our life and where it takes us, that we can deepen our relationship to God through Jesus in a way that makes us a little less inclined to, to lose ourselves into the darkness with overwhelmed 
and to be able to hold on to that sense of a peace that endures in the midst of the storm. So I would just challenge you to, to think about that, about how you might use this season, because generally speaking, when we think about, oh, the rest of our life, that's kind of overwhelming. But for 40 days, could you change the way you live your life, and specifically in relationship to prayer, adding prayer into your life in such a way that there's specific times to pray, but hopefully that, that, that will spread out throughout the course of your life but that the time apart is important, just as it was for Jesus, to be there, to, to, to make him aware of grace out there in the midst of the storms. I challenge you to do the same, to, to make there be space for you to speak to God, but also to listen, to listen with the, with the belief that God really is trying to talk to you. It may not come in words, but God has got guidance to give you and power to give you and that prayer is the means by which this happens and see in Lent is an opportunity to claim this promise please pray with me you know how it is with us oh God you know how we are overwhelmed with anxiety but we thank you for Jesus who has revealed your heart to us. And we know that when Jesus walked on this earth, whenever a person came to him in sincerity of heart, he never rejected them. He loved them. And his words of judgment were for only were for those who came to him in self-righteousness. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk humbly in this season and to call upon the name of Jesus for your mercy, your grace, to sustain us on the journey, to give us a glimpse of your resurrection light in the midst of the darkness and the violence of this world. Help us to be those who embody your peace in a world of such trouble. Help us in our, the way we live connected to you through prayer to witness to your victory over the forces of death and darkness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is Come and Find the Quiet Center, verses 1 and 2. I invite you to stand. Please be seated.
this is the symbolic time in our service where we will hold our offering, bringing our gifts unto the Lord. I thank you for your offerings, your offering of prayer and of your gifts and of your financial offerings to support this very, very important ministry we have to share and live out together the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is absolutely crucial. So thank you for all your support. This is our time when we pray together. And there are prayer comes in many forms. Um, praying together is important, and there's some strength that is received when we pray alone, which should also be supplemented with the prayer alone, with the prayer together. But I will be pausing um, in, our, in my time of prayer for us to name and claim the, the joys the blessings of our life, the gratitude that is there. And I will be pausing at the end to share our concerns. And as you know, I always pray, pause at the, in the middle for a silent time of letting God uh, minister to us in our deepest needs. I don't make that very long. You ever notice that? I make it maybe about 15 seconds. I would make it longer if I thought you could tolerate it. <laughs> but I don't think you can. So practice so that you can tolerate it longer. <laughs> I know I know you people. I know my mind. That's why I know in the silent, oh, your mind starts, oh, racing, priceless. Oh, where am I going to go? What am I going to do with supper? And, you know. <laughs> so, so practice that so you can handle silence a little better, all right? OK. So. Let us be together now in prayer. Be still and know that you are God, says our holy scripture, and in the stillness there you are, is the deepest truth, truth of our lives. We are alive because you chose for us to be alive, gave us this precious gift gift of beholding the beauty and experiencing the love that is knit into life. And we thank you. We thank you for all the beauty in its various forms. We thank you for music. We thank you for the beauty of friendship and for those who have been there with us to share this gift of life, sharing laughter and also sharing tears. We thank you for moments of stillness where we have experienced a parting of the sea and have felt your presence with us when we felt overwhelmed by the storms of life. We thank you for people who have spoken on your behalf without even realizing it in our lives offering us encouragement, offering us kindness, forgiveness, encouraging us to get back up and try again. We thank you for the beauty of the earth. We thank you for courage, for those you've given the grace to manifest courage in our lives in such ordinary ways, the courage to carry on as parents, as friends, as church members, to carry on in our workplaces, to carry on, to try to turn towards the light and away from the darkness. We thank you for all the expressions of courage in these challenging times. We thank you for Jesus who allows us to know who you truly are, God, in your mercy and compassion, in your call and claim upon us. Lord, in your goodness, We offer to you the gratitude of our hearts, so much that we take for granted. And in the stillness, the gratitude arises. 
Thank you, O oh God. And we are aware that there, is, there are wounds inside of us, O oh God. There are ways in which we are stuck. There are wounds we carry within us that keep us from living life graciously, abundantly, lovingly, joyfully. In this moment of silence, we would ask for the grace to open up our hearts and our minds and our bodies to your love. We ask for your Holy Spirit to descend into us, to minister to us with your infinite knowledge in the place of our deepest need. Come, Holy Spirit. Hopefully, oh God, something within us let go, something released, something surrendered to your grace. And hopefully, oh God, we have heard in the stillness a call that our life belongs to you and that you have placed us in this life to be an expression of your love, to be a channel of your grace. You've called us into communion with you through prayer. And through this gift of prayer, we raise up to you the burdens of our lives, the concerns of our lives for others and for ourselves. We raise up to you the people in the Ukraine, people who are feeling frightened, people who are already grieving. We pray for soldiers who find themselves conscripted into battle that they did not choose. We pray that you would strengthen the peacemakers, that we would learn the things that make for peace. We pray that hearts that are intent on violence and war would experience your grace and remember your great prophecies to turn the weapons into plowshares. We pray for all the little ones who are suffering the worst. We pray, O oh Lord, for needs closer at hand. We pray for Wa Chun's longtime friends, Mr. and Mrs. Gregg, who late in life are very sick, and for their daughter, Lucy. We pray for Ian Crawford's daughter, Heather, who is recovering after surgery and waiting on biopsy results from a tumor removed from her, her neck. We pray for Paul's 90-year-old mother, also dealing with cancer and recovering from surgery, and for her husband, Paul's father, and for Paul and all the family in this time. Pray for Arlene Sklo, who's been dealing with health concerns with her stomach, for Anna Weiss and Anna Crystal's mother, Muriel, in a nursing home, as well as Donna Morgan in a nursing home. We pray for, for Diane Morgan in a nursing home. Pray for Diane Morgan's daughter, Donna, and for the child, Christina, who she has raised as they are dealing with a difficult time. We pray for all who are grieving in all the varied forms, and that includes all of us. We pray for our earth and all who have suffered all living beings from the brokenness of our earth. We pray to be better stewards. We pray to be peacemakers. We pray for our families where there is turmoil. We pray
pray for us in our weariness. We ask that you would empower us, O Lord. And grant us your spirit that we may enter into the season of Lent with a renewed intention to follow you. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, prayers for my, <clears throat> excuse me, prayers for my mom's cousin, Peggy, who will be turning 100 at the end of March. Um, she's, she's been pretty healthy all along, but right now she's suffering from some congestive heart failure, and they're trying to get her meds regulated um, so that her heart and her kidneys are both working correctly. Um, Joanne shares a concern for her nephew, Carl, who is being interviewed for a new and better job. Prayers for a positive result. Into your everlasting arms, O oh Lord, we lift these cares. And we would ask that you would kindle the flame of our spirit, our faith, that we would be able to trust that you are already at work in all these needs and that your wisdom far surpasses ours and that you bring good things out of very bad things. Help us to have the eyes to see signs of your presence, your hope, your love among us. Allow us to trust you more deeply with our lives. Help us more deeply to be conscious of your presence guiding us, leading us on the journey. Help us to follow you as you make, as Jesus once more we remember his journey to Jerusalem, to lay down his life for all people, for all people. Pray this all in the precious, precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And our final hymn is a verse of sweet hour of prayer. Please rise. <laughs> Please be seated. Before the final benediction, we pause for announcements. There is coffee hour today, hosted by Tom. Uh, there is also coffee online, because that doesn't depend upon our internet. Um, there are opportunities to connect on Zoom in the course of the week, Tuesdays with Joanne at 2 o'clock, and Fridays at noon with Betsy. And as I mentioned, there is guided meditation sessions on Wednesday and Thursday on Zoom. If you would like to be a part of that, let me know because I don't send an email out to everybody. Uh, I will send an email with the link to you. Um, so we begin Lent this season. Ash Wednesday begins Lent. At 7 o'clock there will be a worship service here, our traditional Ash Wednesday service. Um, there will be opportunities, should you choose, to come forward to the altar to kneel and receive the imposition of ashes as a reminder that our life is precious and uh, that we don't want to waste it and that we are called in this life to follow Jesus. And I invite you to think about how you want to send the season of Lent. 
Also during the season of Lent, uh, there'll be a Tuesday evening class that will begin a week from this coming Tuesday. I will begin the sessions on Zoom with uh, a Lenten devotional, and then I will turn it over to Tim Tyler, who is with us this morning, who has a master's degree in history and has taught us classes in the past that were very enlightening, and he's going to deal with... uh, how we got to these culture wars. He's going to talk about specifically America's obsession with utopia and how we got here. I hope you'll come and find out what that's about. This week's quote is from Henry David, Henry David Thoreau. I went to the woods. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die. Which is a... a, 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 Yeah, let me get that right. And learn how... And not when I came to die. Which is to say, learn how to live before you die. So, which is an appropriate Lenten theme. um, Ash Wednesday theme. So I hope you'll consider being a part of that. The choir is now meeting right around Thursdays. Um, uh, the Motley Crew Christian Band has room in the circle. We'll play, be play, playing again next month. And once again, if you need to be, need groceries or whatever and should not or can't easily get out, we have people who will shop for you. And we also have a fund that uh, was generously given to me. If you are in time of financial straits, please reach out for help. We also are collecting food for the Parsippany Food Pantry, which uh, we invite you to bring to the church. And once again, I thank you for all the ways in which you support our common mission. Any other announcements to make today? All right. Well, just a reminder that uh, United Methodist Women that usually meets on the first Wednesday of United Methodist Women meeting the second Sunday, second Wednesday in March. All right. Okay, please rise for the final benediction. (coughs) Go forth into this world, having glimpsed the light on the mountaintop, that same light which is down in the valley. Go forth to witness to the presence of that eternal light in the midst of the winds of this world. Go forth to witness to God's peace in a world that hungers for that peace. Go forth to bear the beams of God's love. In Jesus' name, amen.